Well, it's 5.30. I guess it's time to call our uh, Monroe County Plan Commission meeting to order. Um, Mr. Wilson, are you here? And would you roll? Um, roll? Okay, uh, call the roll now. Murder Clemens? Here. Ron A. Ray Randolph? Here. Uh, Bernie Geritas said he might be late if he's able to attend at all. Jeff McKim? Here. Jerry Pittsford? Here. And Steinberg? All here. Billy Thomas? Here. Here. Amy Thompson? Here. David Warren? Hello. Uh, right now we have uh, seven members and a quorum. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wilson, would you please introduce the evidence? Uh, yes, I request that the following items be introduced as evidence for tonight's meeting. Monroe County Comprehensive Plan is adopted and amended. Monroe County Zoning Ordinance as adopted and amended. Uh, the Monroe County Subdivision Ordinance as adopted and amended. The rules of procedure of the Monroe County Plan Commission and the cases advertised and docketed for hearing on tonight's agenda. Move we accept the evidence as read. Second that. Okay, I will call the roll on the uh, approval of the introduction of the evidence. Uh, Margaret Clemens? Yes. Jeff uh, McKim? Yes. Jerry Pitcher? Yes. Jim Steinbrook? Yay. Julie Thomas? Yes. Amy Thompson? Yes. David Warren? Yes. Uh, the admission of evidence is approved by a seven to zero vote. Didn't come. Is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. I would just like to say I'm needed. Yeah, okay, I, I note the arrival of Toronto Ray Randolph and we'll show him uh, as a present. Uh, so we know I was present him. during the roll call as well and I said here, so you okay, can't yeah, hear we'll me, right? Roll call vote. We can hear you now. Okay, so I must have had some audio issues. Sorry. Welcome. Hey, the vote is on the uh, Approval of the agenda. A vote in favor is vote to approve the agenda as published. Robert Clemens? Yes. Arne Ray Randolph? Yes. Jeff McKim? Yes. Jerry Pittsford? Yes. Jim Stabrook? Yes. Julie Thomas? Yes. Amy Thompson? Yes. David Warren? Yes. The agenda is approved by an 8 to 0 vote. Okay, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the August 18th meeting? Move we approve the minutes. Second. Okay, I will call the roll on approval of the August uh, Plan Commission, approval of the uh, August Plan Commission minutes. Uh, a vote in favor is vote to approve the minutes. Mara Clements? Yes. Tron Randolph? Yes. Jeff McCann? Yes. Jerry Pitzer? Yes. Jim Steinberg? Yes. Julie Thomas? She chatted that she has to step away for a moment. Okay, Amy Thompson? Yes. David Warren? Yes. Uh, the minutes are approved by a 7 0 vote with uh, one member not voting. Wonderful. Well, we're moving on now to administrative business. Is there anything to report in this category? Uh, I have uh, none at this time. Okay, and there's no, no unfinished business, so we're moving on to the new business. And um, the first item on the agenda is item 2008-SAD-10, and this is the Fields Town of Sanders Type E Subdivision right-of-way with request. So, um, Tammy, is Tammy here? Would you please uh, present the case? Okay, um, right, so this is, we have heard this previously as a rezone. Here's a right of way with waiver request. Um, Jackie, if you wanted to start scrolling down. Uh, the request is for a right of way with waiver it be at the corner between East Sanders Second Road and South Fairfax under the fields, town of Sanders type E subdivision, uh, administrative subdivision plat. And the purpose of this is to um, you know, by granting this waiver, it will help protect historic truck structures under historic preservation overlay 
that was approved under ordinance 2020-09 with the condition of approval that the petitioner submit an accurate recorded legal description with proposed right of way requirement waiver. Um, so that's what they're doing here. They're fulfilling their rezone requirement. So this is a conditional use requirement. Um, that was a condition as well. Uh, South Fairfax Road requires a 45 foot right of way dedication uh, and East Sander Second is classified as a local road and requires a 25 foot right of way dedication. Uh, so go ahead and this is located at that corner, 69 or 6189 South Fairfax Road in Perry Township. It is zoned, um, well, it's zoned suburban residential. It's also eco overlay three and recently added the HP overlay. So it has three types of zones associated with the lot. Comprehensive plan has it in the designated community for the Smithville Sanders area. And this is the, the site conditions. So mostly what people have been seeing is the Eastern lot that's been associated with the overlay, the historic preservation overlay. We're also including in this um, parcels to the east. So when this first arrived to us, it was discovered that there was no description for the far eastern part of the property. It did go through a uh, quiet title process, which was associated with the state and was recently, I guess, I think in July was approved. So it was able to move forward and be submitted at this, as this type E subdivision um, to do kind of a lot line shift to make the western lot larger, which would allow the septic system to be on the same parcel as the structure itself. So that's a picture of the septic system. That's what they're trying to capture on the same lot as well as parking as well as, well as parking spaces uh, for their tourist home use. And this is just an overview of the area. Um, this, is, this was recently approved as a conditional use as a tourist home. Uh, they'll be working most likely with the Whippoorwill Hills uh, farm to the north on that red star there and, you know, kind of in tandem uh, doing events and, and hosting that kind of thing in the area. These are some of the photos. To the bottom left, you'll see the old gas pumps. They're currently not in place. They're being restored, but they are planning to bring those back. Uh, when the Historic Preservation Board was reviewing the site and staff also noticed that a, a right-of-way dedication would leave these hanging out in the road, essentially, uh, we thought it best for the petitioner to have to, you know, to ask for this waiver. Unfortunately, this is the only process that we can go through to issue these right-of-way with waivers. But in a sense, now these gas pumps, when they're replaced, will be uh, protected under the HP overlay and... and you know, I think that's a, a goal for for all of the historic preservation and restoration out there. Uh, the bottom picture is East Sanders Second. These two photos are South Fairfax Road, looking both north and south, and the intersection with East Sanders. This is the plat that was submitted for the Fields Town of Sanders Type E subdivision. Normally, this is an administrative process. But in this case, because they're asking for the right of way with waiver, which is the shaded area. So they're reducing the size of their lot, essentially. And they're wanting to not, um, they're not wanting to dedicate where the road is actually on their property. So they're, they're requesting that the road be not accepted as a part of their legal description, which also then in that purple circle there, uh, keeps their gas pumps out of the way. And you can also clearly see now the two lot lines and where they will be once this process is completed. Uh, next slide. So Bynum Fania did provide findings for the waiver, which does include both lot one and lot two. Uh, that was a request after Platt committee that they upgrade this letter to include lot two, since it does look like they're trying to keep the road from being described in their property. Next. Uh, this is the old town plat, just kind of showing that like there really was a gap. There was no description for the west or for the eastern part of this property. So it's just kind of demonstrating the quiet title process that it went through first. And 
Stormwater had no comments. The highway engineer uh, comments for the right of way with waiver essentially uh, they are supporting what was presented and um, yeah, they're basically in support of the waiver. Next slide, highway department uh, report. There's no conditions that they're requiring. They have already basically installed the two driveways for lot uh, one and lot two has a, has a driveway as well. So there's three driveways, um, everything seems to be fine out there in working order at this point. There was a request from the highway department that they update a letter uh, describing that the gas pumps um, can't, will remain inoperable when they are replaced, that the gas pumps do not interfere with the um, line of sight to East Sanders Second and South Fairfax intersection, um, and just kind of having this common understanding between the petitioners and Monroe County Highway Department. Uh, both parties have signed off that they're okay with the replacement of these, of these gas pumps and have updated this letter. The Platt Committee recommended a positive recommendation with a vote of two to zero. And they had put some previous conditions on, but those have been met at this time, which we saw just with the last two letters, those two updated exhibits in the packet. Uh, and so uh, petition 2008-SAD-10, staff recommends approval based on the findings of fact, subject to the highway, county highway and drainage engineer reports. Any questions? Yeah, Jeff. I um, just wanted to see, is this the essentially the, I know, the last step for this, uh, this project or are there some more? They uh, have filed. They have filed everything. Uh, frankly, we still need to sign off that the, all the conditional use conditions have been met to do their tourist home. And we we need to finalize their site plan. Staff has simply just not had time to review. We're swamped right now. <laughs> we're, we're working through just the final administrative steps to try to get them to be able to be permitted as a tourist home. Okay, so there are any more uh, either plan commission or BZA or commissioner's approvals that will be needed? I hope not. No, okay. they should not be before. And not for this, not for this lot. Um, if they ever decide to add signage or change something on the lot externally, uh, it would be required to go back to the Historic Preservation Board for approval. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other uh, questions from the commission of staff? Looks like Jim Steinbrook has his hand up. Okay, Jim. Well, it, it may be premature, but I would prefer to move approval of this waiver request. Well, we do have to, I know the fields are on the phone line and we do need to hear from, uh, from the petitioner and any opponents to the petition. So um, would the petitioner or the petitioner's uh, representative like to address the plan commission? Hi, this is Kay Fields. Um, I'm sorry, I was a little late joining the meeting, having some technical difficulty on my end. Um, so I didn't miss, I didn't hear everything Tammy said. So I'm wondering if anyone has questions for me, I'll be certainly happy to answer them. I think uh, to me, it looks straightforward. Um, do, do any members of the plan commission have any questions for Ms. Fields? If none, I'd like to ask if there's anyone present who would uh, like to speak in opposition to the petition. And if there's none, we can entertain that motion now, Mr. Stainbrook. I'm sorry, I obviously jumped the gun. Yes, I'd like to enter that. Uh motion whereby I move the approval. I move the approval of this waiver request. I second. second. I'm sorry, was, was, is there a, um, a, a second hearing to be waived or is, is this the final one? Uh, I think it was, they had requested a waiver of the second hearing, yes. Uh, Tammy, I would include that in my motion then if that's appropriate. And I would second that too. Okay. Mr. Wilson, would you please call the roll?
Larry, you're on mute. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, let me start over. Uh, the vote is on petition number 2008-SAD-10, fields right-of-way waiver request for a type E subdivision within the town Sanders uh, for a property located at 6189 North Fairfax and 1655 East Sanders. Uh, a vote to approve the waiver. Uh, a yes vote is a vote to approve the waiver uh, with request. Uh, Tron Henry Randolph? Yes. Uh, Jeff McKim? Yes. Jerry Pittsford? Yes. Jim Steinberg? Yes. Julie Thomas? Yes. Amy Thompson? Yes. David Warren? Yes. And Margaret Clemens? Yes. Okay, the uh, waiver is granted by an eight to zero vote. Thank you, Kay, and thanks for showing up yet again for uh, this property that you're uh, bringing back to commercial value. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Have a good evening. You too. Bye-bye. Okay, we're moving on to the second case for this evening, and that's for uh, item number 2009-PUO-02, and that's Westgate on 3rd, a planned unit development outline plan. Um, so is it Anne Cresselius here, and would she like to present the case? I'm going to yeah. present for Anne this evening, Margaret. Okay, great. Thank you, Jackie. Sure. So this is a petition site that's 37.99 acres, located at 4755 West State Road 48. The location here is close to uh, Fieldstone you have to the west. You're adjacent to the city of Bloomington jurisdiction, and then you also have Cook and Ivy Tech. The current zoning of the property is RE 2.5 as well as RE 1. And you also have the Cars Farm Greenway um, to the west. The comprehensive plan has this area as mixed residential as well as mixed use closer to West State Road 48. And the site conditions here are fairly flat. Uh, they did submit a karst report uh, with this submission and there is a sizable sinkhole in this area where the mouse is and it's also noted on the site plan in the next slides. So I just have a few aerial imagery uh, photos of this site. It is currently a farm owned by uh, Miss Miller and she is still on the site. Um, and then there is access to the site being proposed off of Park Square Drive. Um, and then you also have um, the school right here as well. And then um, there is a, a rail or a, a road a spur to the site that we will discuss in, in the next few slides. Um, so using the uh, street view here, you can see um, right along Fieldstone, there is a road that spurs to this property known as West King Rail Drive. And uh, the imagery on the right hand side is showing the Cars Farm Greenway. And there is some um, crossing striping here but there is actually no road there currently. So one of the conditions that we'll talk about um, that staff had previously recommended a road connection, we have since removed that and feel that the petitioner's request to put in a uh, emergency service road only would be appropriate given the proximity to the school and the um, contiguous Cars Farm Greenway trail without other road crossings in the area. So this site is requesting to be zoned PUD, plan unit development, and they're putting together a list of uses and densities and other standards that we would um, be able to evaluate the site by. So they've split it up into three sections, A, B, and C, Oops, sorry. Um, so just a, a quick rundown of what they're requesting, total 330 units, uh, and that equals an area A about 10 and a half units to the acre plus commercial space. Area B, you have 8.45 units to the acre plus a clubhouse area. And then area C is about eight units to the acre. 
Um, they offer a few different kind of residential types in these three areas. And area A is where you have some of the uh, retail and office space that's going to be offered um, to the public. So this is um, the petitioner's site plan here. They've updated this since the last time uh, at the administrative meeting. They've since made the trails a little bit more noticeable in the light pale yellow color. So you can see there's connectivity throughout the neighborhood. Um, I did want to put together just kind of a, a quick table. It's not very comprehensive in terms of everything, but Anne had done a great job in the report and just visualizing some of these differences between what we would require based on the zoning for this area and then what is being uh, proposed as um, in this area. So signs, um, property marker or property signs, monument signs, wall signs. Um, typically in the residential zones, we have a 32 square foot maximum. They're proposing uh, altogether about 525 square feet of proposed signage. Parking, we ask that for a multifamily, it's about 1.3 spaces per unit. And then for commercial, it's 1.3 spaces per gross floor area. Um, and they're averaging about 1.72 parking spaces per unit for residential and 1.3 or a little over per gross floor area for commercial. So they're meeting our parking minimums. Um, landscaping, they are requesting that uh, they do parking islands every 15 spaces, and typically we have parking islands every 10 spaces. And then for the interior plantings, we request typically that there's 10% of the entire parking area be covered in, in interior landscaping, and they'd like that capped at about 5% of the parking area. Um, open space requirement for PUDs is about 25%, and they're proposing 60%, so well over the minimum uh, needed. And then density for the zoning, which is RE1 and RE2.5, is somewhere between 0.4 and one unit to the acre, and they're asking for up to 10 and a half units to the acre, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, they've also put together a more in-depth um, topographical map and site plan. So you can take a look um, at the parking areas as well as the buildings. They are proposing to preserve many of the trees along the edges of the property. Um, but based on the ordinance, these trees, if they were removed, would have to be replaced with buffer yards. So there is an incentive for them to keep these trees in these locations as stated. Um, and this is the southern part of the lot as well. So there's a, a buffer yard between the neighborhood here to the west field zone. The highway department does not have a driveway permit application for this site at, the, at this time. They have reviewed the general location on Park Square. And uh, Paul, our highway engineer, is on the call. And he's also talked to them about any other um, necessary turn lanes from the site to just kind of ease any traffic in and out of the property. Um, at this time, he hasn't requested a traffic study. Um, and then Stormwater has submitted a preliminary drainage report to our MS4 coordinator and their preliminary plan appears to be reasonable according to our MS4 coordinator. So staff is recommending a positive recommendation to the county commissioners. We do have a few conditions that we'd like to tie into this uh, recommendation to the commissioners, including um, commit to any site distance improvements for the intersections at Park Square Drive. So making sure that they can meet the driveway permit requirements. Um, commit to any offsite road improvements of Park Square Drive, including street approaches, driveway approaches. Um, and having two exit lanes to provide adequate capacity at the intersections with Park Square. And then uh, we also have two kind of more administrative requests, which is to update the outline plan to include specific property boundary setbacks. We know that this is going to be built all in one phase, but if they were to um, add a, an additional building through a development plan amendment, we need to have standards by which we would set those boundaries of where those next buildings could potentially go on the site. And then we also need to 
tie down the specific type of retail uses permitted in area A that um, broadly just says retail uses. So those are staff um, recommendations. And then I know the petitioner also has a PowerPoint with a bit more information if the plan commission wishes to uh, view that when the petitioner uh, speaks. I'll take any questions. Jeff? Okay, so just to confirm now, at this point, the two points of ingress and egress are going to be essentially Bell Avenue and Sunset Avenue on uh, Park Square. Across from, yes. Yeah, across from, okay. Correct, yeah, you can kind of see they're a little bit off, um, off a little bit, but yeah, pretty close to, um, yes, Park Square. Okay. And then there are also, there are currently two city bus stops uh, that right. abut this property along Park Square. Yes, and those, uh, the petitioner stated that they will offer some improvements to those bus stops and also a private shuttle service to, um, I believe the Cook property, Ivy Tech and some other surrounding um, employers. Thank you. Margaret? Yes, uh, just as it stands now with the RE1 and the RE2.5, by right, they have an opportunity to build somewhere between 14 and uh, 20, maybe uh, homes on that farmland. Is that correct? The way it's currently coded and zoned? Yeah, if we take a look at the uh, current zoning map, um, the, the majority of the site is RE 2.5. So yeah, I would say your estimate, it's about 38 acres and this would be minimum lot size of two and a half acres, whereas RE 1 would be minimum lot size of one acre. So if they were to subdivide, um, they could yeah achieve about that density. Okay, and in the packet, um, there there were a lot of figures that were presented and you did not present any of that yet. Is that something that the petitioner will present? Is that um, from the first appraisal group, for instance, on Monroe County housing units by number of units in structure? Um, is that something you provided it to us, but is that something that you um, researched or is that something that the petitioner is providing? The appraisal was submitted by the petitioner. They do have that in their slide deck as well. So um, they're going to be covering some of that information. That's, yeah. Okay, all right. Are there any other questions of a staff among members of the plan commission? Looks like Dave and then Jerry had their hands raised. Okay, uh, Dave? Yeah, um, I'm just wondering if you could, if, if there's an image of what that new, um, emergency connection to the, the Stone Chase neighborhood uh, would look like. And I, I think, so now the plan is to, to only allow emergency vehicles through there, correct? That is their proposal. Yes, so okay. I'm trying to see if they have um, this. Uh, that is that where you live, Dave? In I live um, in the neighborhood just to the west in Fieldstone. Okay. Uh, and so the, the neighborhood uh, this would be adjacent to is Stone Chase. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess my, my question is, and this isn't a, a big question I have, but let's say at some point 20 years into the future, it makes sense to just connect those. Would that be an easy connection or would that be a, a difficult connection um, policy-wise or engineering-wise to, to make? <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question, Dave. Um, the connection that they're proposing right now, I believe, is one lane, and it would be all private through here. So our authority to later require an improvement of a private road may be a little bit tricky, um, particularly because this is being proposed to be developed in one phase. And so if that is the case and it is developed in one phase and it is completed, we would actually only withhold a um, maintenance bond for the public improvements to the site in the amount of 10%. 
Um, so in that case, it, it does kind of reduce our ability to come back and later ask someone to improve this unless the developer wanted to say, add another building or come back <clears throat> for an outline plan amendment. Um, something like that would be our hook. Okay. Um, okay. I, I guess I, I, I ask that because right now I, I don't see a need for the, for that connection just because of what exists um, to the west of this proposed development. Um, I would just hate to foreclose upon a, a connection if one is, is needed in the uh, in the future. Um, and so I, I don't have really anything to say uh, more about that other than it's just something something I'm, I'm thinking about um, for this. Okay. Jerry has his hand raised. You're on mute, Jerry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sorry. I was just, and I think I have the answer to my question. Um, I was trying to figure out if that uh, Park Square is a signalized intersection. I believe it is. Yes. Okay. So we've got a, a signalized intersection where basically everything in this development can access 48 through a signalized intersection. Yes but it's not increasing the usage at that intersection because it has limited access to the residential neighbors. Because you're um, only accessing, what are the two, what are the access points into South Park Square? Is that, is Sunset Avenue coming in? Yes, yeah, so you have where the cursor is here, the first driveway and then the second driveway uh, right here as well. So, okay, so that's Sunset, right? Yes, uh, Sunset and Bell. And Jeff, I, will, um, I told you it wasn't directly across. It appears in the other site plan. It looks off-centered, but it does appear to be centered in this um, plan here. So. Okay, so where the cursor is right there, that's Sunset? Uh, this is Sunset and this is Bell. Where's Bell? Where the cursor is up here. Okay. All right. Okay. So I got you now. Right. I had missed that. That's what I was trying to figure out. But anything to the, um, let me get my brains, whether that be the West is not um, accessing it. It's just everything to the East. Is that correct? Right, this this would be the only connection to the West, this King Rail, and it would be emergency vehicle only restriction. Right, right, okay. All right, so I, I just really didn't want to see a situation where we started flooding that uh, intersection at the light and everybody in the residential neighborhood flowing through that area, especially during uh, morning hours and afternoon hours when people are coming to school. Uh, John has his hand raised, and then Jeff. So this goes to what you were just um, pointing out. Um, on the image we see now, um, it looks like those streets do align, but looking over here on the plat, you can tell that they definitely are staggered. And I'm, I'm wondering why... It, um, is that just intentional not to get, you know, people to accidentally go through there? Um, yeah, you can see how that's staggered a bit more. If you could highlight that, Jackie, that'd be nice. And my point being is I, I really think they should kind of line up because if there's any need for a stop sign or such, I, I don't see why they would be staggered and I don't see how that would impact it. Could you just circle, do your cursor around that little connection on that plat right there? right there to so see how they just don't line up and that that's the same with the one on the bottom so um i guess when the petitioner gets to speak if they could talk to that um of why they if it's just kind of the configuration of how the buildings lay on the lot or if that was done to try to mitigate any through traffic because if there is no exiting then i think that's just going to mitigate it within itself and then also, I guess, Lisa, that might fall with you as far as the right of way, as far as if there's any need for a stop sign there in the future or such, would it, wouldn't it? would it be better if those um, line up more precise? 
typ typically in, in development, you would want intersections to line up. Um, we can, I know Paul's on here for an engineering, um, from an engineering standpoint, but again, yeah, typically you would line up intersections. Um, so to help eliminate turning movement complex. Thank you. And uh, Jackie, I, if you know anything to that, that would be great, but I can wait until the petitioner could uh, address that. Yeah, as I pointed out in the slides, they haven't applied for driveway permits quite yet. That's um, something that would happen after the approval and the development plan stages. So they would, I think Paul and Ben would both ask them to try and line that up. But at that point, it would be solidified the exact location of the driveway, which is probably why it's skewed from plan to plan. Um, David, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just I guess I just want to second those concerns just because I, I think most people exiting um, Westgate uh, are going to be making a left there to go north to State Road 48. And, and so I think it could be uh, it could. Yeah, it could pose some problems there um, if they're not if they're not lined up. Jeff, you have your hand raised. Yeah, just uh, this sort of relevant to that same discussion. I do believe that Bell goes all the way out to Curry Pike. Is that is that correct? So Sunset is just kind of a dead end in the in the Highland Park uh, in the Highland Village neighborhood, but but Bell is actually a, could actually be a cut through. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I have it cut off here, but I I can get another map shown up. So this one's Bell and this one's Sunset. I'll pull that up on the side. Okay. Um, Margaret, did you have a comment or question? Um, I would just like to note that while we're here, um, the surrounding neighborhoods are primarily single family homes, but you do see in the left-hand corner, is that Park Square there or Orchard Glen? That's Orchard Glen. Yeah. And uh, as, as the, it used to be called Park Square. So um, I just want you to see topographically how the proposed development might be similar to or vary from the ex surroundings. So thank you, Jackie. Sure. I'll note along Park Square, we do have a good number of duplex units, but yeah, a lot of single family in this area as well. Yes. Thank Jerry? You. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, hey, um, I was looking a little farther down there. Um, I realize it's a it's a little further stretch, but and and Lisa may be able to alleviate my concerns. But are we going to be overloading this signalized intersection because I see Woodside down there, um, where it intersects with Park Square by the school, would actually allow a, quite a number of residents to get out and access that signalized intersection. I, I realize they probably have another way of reaching um, their destinations, but are we gonna be really throwing a lot of traffic on that? It's my only concern. Okay. Uh, Paul, do you have, are you on the call, Paul? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Could you speak a little bit to that question that Jerry had about the signalized intersection a, lo a load that it could take or maximum capacity it could take? Yeah, that was one of the intersections we had in our Southwest Corridor study, and it, it currently has plenty of capacity to handle a development like this, so that shouldn't be a problem. Good. I realize they still have access through Curry Pike, but I didn't know if this was going to become a path of, least, of less resistance, <laughs> saying least resistance in there, this area is... Uh, uh, really not true, but, um, you know, I just worry about increasing the traffic load in front of that school during um, morning drop off, uh, especially, but also even an afternoon pickup. Well, your, your peaks, your commuter peaks are actually different than your school peaks. Your commuter peak is usually between 7 and 8, 7.30, 8.30, and then your school is a little bit later at 9.00 or so and not then my in the school. afternoon pardon not my school well elementary schools typically right um, well i'm in elementary school but we still drop off early but we're not mccsc so 
Yeah, and then your afternoon peak, your school is usually, you know, goes first, 2.30, 3.30, and then your commuter peaks later than that. So they're not really, they don't really overlap. So that's a good thing. Right. I'm not trying to be devil's advocate here or anything. I just wanted to be sure because I do know the consequence of increased traffic on those roads that serve schools. Thanks, Jerry. Julie has her hand raised. Yeah, so um, I think I would like to see um, a bit more analysis of the traffic maybe for next month um, for the packet um, because um, so looking at page 26 of the packet, there's um, a list of, it says apartment in red, apartment parking summary, does not include clubhouse and guest parking. So um, there's 192 garage spaces and 374 surface parking spaces for a total of 566. And I don't know what I would need. I just need some clarification on what the 434 number is. Um, but if you take 566 spaces, or if you take the number of units um, and assume studios will have one vehicle and um, the larger units may have two, um, that can be a lot of traffic. Um, and um, I also, so I would like a review of the traffic, especially on a two lane road um, that's, um, you know, I'm not really worried about State Road 48, Third Street, because that has been overbuilt, right? It's been built to a very high capacity. So that's not my concern, um, but it really is. Park Square. So if we could get a look at what that num what that kind of vehicle usage in it in a subdivision does in terms of intersections, I think that would be really useful. I imagine that the intersection closer to Third Street is the one that will be used most often, the entrance exit there. Um, but um, just because I would assume. You know, yes, there are ways to cut through to Curry, uh, but I would just assume that most folks would would head either um, if they're going to the school that way, but most folks would be heading to Third Street because that's where Cook and Ivy Tech and everything else is. So I would I would really just like more of a breakdown of of how that's how that works. Um, we're we don't have to the signage comes with the next phase, right? Yes, but that's a huge disparity in signage and I'm assuming that that disparity relates to each of those individual signs that they listed because they're talking about building signs and unit signs and all that. Okay, so I think um, just some clarity on that would be useful because I don't know that it's too much. I don't, you know, what do other apartments have? What's typical? So I think I would like some clarity on that. Um, I am um, um, yeah, I think we do need we do need clarification on the third street portion, and you know that's the other part of this when we talk about the traffic. Is if that is retail, that traffic is going in off of third street and then off of Park Square as well. So I think I think I would like to see a lot more clarification about that because. No matter what it is that's developed as a retail or business office combo, um, that is additional traffic driven from outside, potentially outside the complex to the area. And so I think we need some clarity on whether there are enough traffic, uh, I'm sorry, parking spaces for visiting vehicles at the the commercial space, I'll just call it commercial space, but the mixed use space up on Third Street, um, is that enough parking? And then how much, if you're looking at that, a certain amount of traffic per day, you have to add that into the potential traffic, not only of what the residents have, but um, what you're adding um, there with commercial. So I, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It would be good to have something walkable for the folks who live in that area, but at the same time, 
not everybody's going to walk there. So what what the what the vision is needs some clarification, especially with traffic. Um, so I will I will leave it at that for now. Thanks. Okay, and then I see Lisa has her hand raised, and then Margaret. So just since they were on the traffic and um, different situations out there, and want a little bit of information, I just want them to also look. I travel this area all the time, going from the showers building to the highway department to my house. Um, I'm not sure what the school drop off and pick up um, process is, but I can tell you at this point in the afternoon that the traffic backs out onto Park Square Drive both directions, waiting for um, pickup for the children. So it's it backs up out there. I would say when I was out there last, I want to say it was at least 10 cars deep going towards 48. So I don't know if that's something you might want to look when they do the traffic analysis or work with the school system on a process for that. Um, so anyway, I just want to throw that out there when they're thinking about everything. I'd be grateful for a backup only 10 cars deep on Reeves. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, uh, Margaret had her hand raised and then David. Yeah, and I, I'm not so sure, or and I'm not uh, convinced that analyzing again the traffic on 48 and 3rd Street isn't uh, applicable here because there is that section of uh, 3rd Street where there's a, a stoplight or traffic light perhaps in every half mile. And between Curry Pike and uh, 69, uh, frequently the streets cannot accommodate uh, those who go through the lights, you know, so they the traffic does stack up and um, I think that analyzing it east of, of the de proposed development is um, perhaps more important than analyzing it west of the development on 48 and 3rd Street. So uh, that's a very congested area. So uh, thank you. Thanks, Margaret. And then Dave had his hand raised. Yeah, and I guess I'm going to second Commissioner Thomas's comment in the chat that um, I think it would be hard to study how this relates to the, the school line right now just because of COVID. Um, I, that's my kids' school, and so when I used to pick them up uh, when they first started there, it was pretty, pretty quick in and out, and I know now um, because they're encouraging folks, I think, to drop their kids off. My, my kids are remote right now, so I'm not sure, quite sure how it's working, but I think that line is, is longer simply because of the precautions they have to take, just something to keep in mind. Thanks, Dave. Does anyone else from the Plan Commission have questions? I just want to note that there is somewhat of a conversation in the chat um, so maybe you would want to address that, Jackie, just what has been going on. Okay. Um, yeah, so it looks like I'll just go ahead and read these out quickly. So um, someone from the public, Will Smith says, uh, people could also connect with Park Square via Gifford to the south, and Gifford has a stoplight with Curry. Jerry uh, mentioned he didn't think of that. Woodside Drive residents would also be able to ac access the signalized intersection. And then Will Smith reminded us that Park Square houses along there are duplexes and single family are further east and duplexes along some of the east-west roads in the section of Highlands. There are several two-story apartment buildings in Bell Harvey Parkway area. Um, and then Julie had mentioned the COVID-related changes to uh, elementary schools right now. They don't want to send children on buses, so maybe we should look at 2019 data. Um, and then Jeff McKim noted State Road 48 moves pretty smoothly, um, drop off, pick up, Sun every day at Cook and take Third Street from I-69 to Cook. And while there's certainly lights, the traffic never stacks up except around Liberty. Um, and then Margaret mentions that whenever she travels it, the traffic stacks up. Okay, so is there any other further discussion among members of the Plan Commission or questions of staff by members of the Plan Commission? And if none, we can move on to the um, 
petitioner or the petitioner's representative? Is Mr. Butler here and would you like to uh, make a presentation to us? Uh, <laughs> Margaret, if I may, before you begin that, I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Pittsburgh. None of my concerns are prohibitive. It's just for consideration because uh, I don't see a danger presented. I want to be sure that I was clear. It's more inconvenience and delay. And as long as uh, it's well posted and drivers rec recognize that, um, I, I think is really a minor inconvenience in the big picture. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So moving on, um, is the petitioner here and would you like to address the plan commissioner? Commissioner. Um, Yes, please. Um, I think you can hopefully hear me. My name is Mark Avis, um, and I would like to present a slideshow um, and then be available to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Avis. Um, and Jack, every time I finish, I'll just say next slide. I hope this loads up. Um, to just the first question, these streets will align. Um, we've had have, have discussions with, um, I think the, the authority road commission, our engineer is available to answer questions, but the roads will align at both those intersections. Um, so let me go through this quick overview of the development. We consider this a, a mixed use PUD on, on a truly infill 38 acres. Uh, we consider it really one project developed, managed, and controlled by a seasoned development team. It will be built as one phase over 18 months. We'll have one financial guarantee for all the site improvement costs, and one financing entity will be, um, will be financing the entire development. Overall, it's a low density market rate multifamily community at 8.68 units to the acre. We're committed to using only high quality materials, which is cement-based siding with brick and masonry accents. All street improvements um, will be um, private. And we utilize smart clustering to, to provide abundant open space. As Jackie mentioned, we're providing 60% non-impervious area. And we do provide two neighborhood connections to Park Square Drive. It's important to note that there are physical boundaries, which Jackie described. The Karst Trail is along the entire western property line, um, and the school is to the south. Um, the site plan has been designed to interface with the other neighborhoods in a safe manner. Residents from Stone Chase could easily walk over or bike over to utilize the private office suites, and many of them have inquired about when they'll be available, um, and there's pretty so far high demand for those as well. Next slide. So overall, there are 84 barrier-free apartments. We call them barrier-free because the buildings along 3rd Street, buildings one, two, and three will have elevators. There'll be residents on the second and third floor. There will be private office suites in, in buildings one and three. And we did incorporate retail in building two um, per the suggestions of prior meetings with the, plan, the planning administration. Lastly, there'll be a clubhouse pool um, and fitness room available to the residents. There'll be 95% of the units will be, basically not only 5% will be three bedrooms. So we don't expect any burden to the schools. Um, again, um, building neighborhood B are 120, uh, 126 traditional three-story apartments and neighborhood C are 120 townhome styles that are two stories. Neighborhood B and C all have attached or detached garages available with surface parking. Next slide, Jackie, please. So we consider this a great aerial for a few different reasons. One, you see the size of the development. This is 38 acres. It is one of the last large vacant pieces of property that is truly infill from, for Monroe County. This is a mix, a mix of housing alternatives close to employment districts equals actually less commuter time, less gas emissions, and a greater quality of life for people that want to live and work near, to live where the, near where they work. Also, when you look at the aerial, you'll notice how this is a great transitional piece from the apartments and the duplexes, and they're all duplexes along Park Square Drive. You have apartments on the southeast portion, and then you have single family homes to the east. To the south is a school, and to the west is, is Stone Chase. 
um, and the single family homes. And obviously you can see again, how close we are to the employment bases of Monroe County and the key stakeholders, and also to the retail. The retail is, is also walkable and bikeable and the Karst Trail is a 4.5 mile pathway that obviously that we're aware of. Next slide. So over the last six months, we have conducted extensive community outreach um, to homeowners, employment bases, businesses in the area. We sent out over 250 letters to the homeowners with detailed, with, with full details on our, on our proposal. We've answered and had numerous phone calls with different residents and also, and also companies. We'd like to say that we're, this, this is the first project that has been so supportive that I've been involved with over 25 years from companies, homeowners, and businesses. This letter from Cook summarizes, we believe, why this project should be approved in this location. The comprehensive plan of Monroe County talks about it, having an expanded range of housing and lifestyle choices will attract the workforce it needs and retain those who reside here. The, Cook's, the Cook letter summarizes this. They feel that there's a need for multifamily apartments at this location. Their employees, and I think they talked to their home, their human resource department, their employees want a new re a rental community in this area. Their employees desire modern amenities. Their employees can walk and bike to work. We will have a shuttle service available, which I'll just explain later. And they also like the three different housing um, types that we're providing because they, they will attract and, and appeal to different ranges of demographics. And overall, Cook says this is a very exciting development. Next slide, Jackie. Again, from Ivy Tech, just a, the support letter from Ivy Tech includes the same and mirrors the support of Cook. Next slide, please. So for the Regional Opportunity Initiatives, ROI, in addition to what Cook and Ivy Tech is saying, they also mentioned that there's a need for barrier-free housing in Monroe County. This is for people that can basically age and stay in Monroe County through their lifestyle. The letter also describes how this development's location, in the development in this location will also help bring down actually the cost of living for people that Live, work in the area and want to live in the area. Next slide. And from the BEDC, Bloomington Economic Development Corporation, they mentioned how there is a significant shortage of housing and how attractive this will be to new companies that are looking to relocate in Monroe County. Again, talks about having a range of housing choices for not only the workforce it needs to retain, but also attract new companies and employees to the area. Next slide, please. From People's Bank, a business in the area, they mentioned the shortage of, the shortage of housing um, and how new housing creates vitality to an area. The bank will greatly benefit from this development. Their clients will greatly benefit from this development and large and small employers in the area will benefit from this development. Next slide, please, Jackie. And lastly, two support letters from a couple of the businesses in the area that felt strong enough to write a support letter. You know, they, they, they mentioned the same thing. They are small businesses that are struggling. They have struggled and having 300 new households in this area will contribute to their vitality. Next slide, please. Talk about need um, for the development and in this area. It all comes down to, to supply and demand. People that want in a, a modern apartment community, the renters by choice, are forced to live far away from the area and pay or pay a premium and pay a premium to live or pay a premium to live near work. This is current data that shows that the housing area in this, in this area is old with no amenities and there is no availability. The housing that is available is primarily the duplexes, and you know they're at you know at at, their, at, at rents that um, you know, are basically a supply and demand, which is no availability or less affordability. Next slide, please. In terms of transportation, I think this is an important, important slide. Residents in walkable communities drive fewer miles and actually take more trips by foot or bike. This project is walkable to everything. It's adjacent to the 4.5 mile trail that goes all the way north to the YMC and all the way south to the park. 
The site plan has multiple, multiple connections to the, to the trail. We will be also be providing a private shuttle to the businesses um, for our residents. This is actually attractive, especially to Cook, where they're short on parking. There is two exi existing bus stops locations at Park Square Drive. We have voluntarily offered to provide two new enclosed bus shelters at, this at these locations. And again, the locations will align to those roads um, for the residents. Next slide, please. Talking about environmental considerations and stormwater, which is a hot topic um, in Monroe County. We have designed the site to significantly exceed the stormwater guidelines um, within the Cave Creek watershed. Again, our previous code block coverage is not to exceed 40%. There's six dry, dry uh, wetland basins will be constructed, constructed that will exceed uh, the discharge requirements of chapter 761. The detailed car study was submitted and reviewed. Our engineer, Dan Fanel, is, is available, um, but he's been very closely with the drainage board. I think, I think they're pleased with what we're providing, um, and we've met every requirement that they've given us. In terms of traffic, next slide, please, Jackie. In terms of traffic, to show you, Park Square and West Third Street is a full lighted intersection. I also believe just like there's an elementary school across the street, things are, are backing up because people aren't using the buses, the kids aren't walking home, kids are picking up their kids from school. We've never had any issues with our school across the street from us, but now in COVID times there is. Uh, there, our street approaches will not only align with Park Square Drive, but we have agreed to, uh, to provide two exit lanes to provide adequate capacity at these intersections per the recommendations of engineering. Many, are, many of our residents, it should be noted, that will be walking, biking, or shuttling to work. Many of the area homeowners will also be walking or biking to the private office suites versus driving to locations downtown or farther away. One can actually make the argument that this community at this location will actually decrease the amount of traffic along 3rd Street and the amount of traffic in the Bloomington MSA on a daily basis. Next slide. The rest of the samples show um, some of the some of the uh, photos that we'll be presenting. This is just a sample of a concept of the three-story buildings that will be along Third Street. Again, office or retail on the first floors and residence residential on the second or third. Each building will have an elevator. Next slide, Jackie, please. This is a, this is a sample uh, of the of the neighborhood B buildings, um, and this is the actual building itself. Not sure exactly what the final elevation is but this is a building that we're using in neighborhood C. It's important to note that this building in neighborhood B overall is pretty small. It, there's only 18 units, 18 units in each of the buildings. So when you look at the color site plan, you look, you see a lot of buildings, but in, in, in reality, it's gone from higher density on third street. And as you go to lower density and even lower density into area C. Next slide please to show area C, Jackie. So th these are the buildings in area C. Again, density, com density comes down and the mass of the buildings comes down. These are two-story buildings. This is the actual building we'd be using. All the homes in, in this building have private entrances, whether you live on the first or second floor. So if you do live on the second floor, you're entering into your own staircase, your own secure entryway. Um, and again, these buildings have attached um, garages as well and also some detached. So you see the three different neighbor, neighborhoods that we're creating, three different distinct housing types, all appealing to a different demographic base or a different choice of those renters. Next choice, next slide, please. And again, we originally didn't have retail incorporated along Third Avenue. Per the suggestions of planning um, of some of the meetings that we've had, we have incorporated 11,000 square feet of commercial retail in building two along Third Street. The tenants that we'll be looking to attract will not only complement our community, but we're looking to complement the surrounding neighborhoods and uses that people will desire. Fitness oriented, juice bar, et cetera, will be the tenants that we'll be looking to attract. Next slide, please. And again, we'll have, there's actually 22,000 square feet of private office spaces. Um, but again, high demand, 
um, in the area. And we've got a numerous phone calls from neighborhoods and the homeowners in the area. And we're pretty excited to bring that. Even the companies that have a lot of people working from home have explained, have talked about how this is a great um, basically need in the area where there are employees that cook, et cetera, that are working remote. They can actually work remote, but still be close to the corporate office. Next slide, please. These are actual photos of some of the different communities we've done. This is a sample of a clubhouse. Next slide. Again, a pool, which there's, there's nothing in this area that have these types of modern amenities that residents are looking for. Next slide. Sample of interior of the clubhouse for the residents. Next slide. Sample of uh, interior of the apartments. Next slide, please, Jackie. Fitness room, next slide. Dog park area. We also do have a community garden, but there's no photo for that. Next slide. There's meeting space room in the clubhouse, so people can actually have meetings here versus going to Starbucks. Again, post COVID, we think you know, we've always done this, but there's even a greater demand for this type of space. Next slide. There's a secure package room in the clubhouses. Um, they can pick up their package any time of the day. If they're a teacher or a nurse or working late night, they can go pick up their, their package at two in the morning. They actually get a notification on their cell phone. They have a package in, in area in, in locker room B, and there's a code. Um, so this gets right away from the, we call the Amazon phobia. Where's my package? Next slide, please. Again, just want to reemphasize our development team is experienced and on a development like this, you know, doing it in one phase, making cohesive, um, we believe is, is a value to the community. Next slide, please, Jackie. And again, just want to summarize um, the development and why, you know, we also hopefully, you know, would like your support on this development. These are samples or excerpts from Monroe County's comprehensive plans. In summary, we feel this proposal matches and fits in with the majority of Monroe, Com Monroe County's comprehensive plans and goals for the community. Comprehensive plan talks about, the Monroe County talks about providing a variety of density and options to support multifamily developments in locations where it is supported by services and infrastructure. This location has that avail uh, ability. Monroe County talks about there's a high demand right now for new development in the area, again, creating vitality to the neighborhood. The comprehensive plan talks about there are undeveloped sites. We have the 30 acre vacant piece of property right now that we're working with, and these sites are likely to experience development. This site is particularly interesting and always mentioned in the comprehensive plan. Monroe County talks about the changing demographics are creating a need for new housing not currently offered. We are providing three distinct housing types that are not offered in the, in the, in the immediate area or in Monroe County. The comprehensive, comprehensive plan talks about how diverse housing choices in a community can support a more resilient local economy, again, providing vitality to the area, which the companies, businesses, and retail why they support this development. Monroe County should actually should permit increased housing densities where appropriate. We feel this location and why it's been designated as, um, as a higher density piece of land in the comprehensive plan makes sense. And lastly, Monroe County should provide a greater opportunity for diverse housing types and densities. We feel we've done that with this plan. Um, and that is, we appreciate your time. Again, we appreciate um, planning staff's comments and Jackie's presentation. We appreciate, um, again, the recommendation for support. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Avis. Thank you uh, for that nice presentation and your vision for this property. Um, I, I know that there are other members of your team who are present and might like to address the plan commission. Hey, this is Daniel Butler with Bynum Fanu and Associates. Um, Mark did an excellent job really going over um, most aspects of the project. Um, I'll just second what he was mentioning that the intention was the drives would be at the intersection of the existing um, two streets that are already to the adjacent East neighborhood. Um, it just must have gotten offset on that one drawing. And um, 
we've done some extensive um, study on the drainage to date, and um, I'll be here with any uh, other uh, questions that you might have. Um, I do have one question, and it has to do with some of the data presented in the packet. And it, the, the data came from first appraisal group, uh, specifically on page 85, um, the Monroe County housing units by number of units in structure, and the source is the STDB. And what's unclear to me is uh, this data is, um, is stated to refer to Monroe County but I don't know if it includes Bloomington, the city of Bloomington, because it, by the looks of the data, it does not. Um, would you like me to respond to that? Yes, please. Um, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure. Um, I, I, the, the, general, the general scope of, you know, first the, the report um, was really just on a, on a summary of pages one and two. Um, I can get clarification from him. That's a good question. I don't know the answer. Um, but what we wanted to show, and I included this letter when we sent out the mailers to the community and the homeowners, um, was it basically he you, 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 was referencing traffic um, and how this type of community would actually be beneficial to the homeowners in the area. Um, but in per, per, per specific data, um, I can get more clarification for you on that. Wonderful. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Julie, you have your hand raised? Yes, um, thanks. Um, yeah, that data clarification would be great. And I would also add that I'm not sure I understand the information on page 68 and what we're supposed to glean from that. So I would say that some clarifications needed there. Um, uh, I also, um, I, I mentioned that I have questions about the number of parking spaces and um, and traffic, but I guess I'm I'm curious too, and I think it would be helpful to have um, some information about in the next go round about the number of visitor spaces um, and um, you know around the apartment buildings themselves, since there isn't street parking at Park Square or on uh, West Third, of course. So. Um, what I don't want to have happen is to have the neighborhood to the west inundated with people parking and then walking across into this development. I think that would be a detriment to that um, neighborhood to the west. Um, the other thing I would say is that it is really difficult to plan uh, for any kind of business right now because of COVID. And I think you're hearing this interest in remote remote workspace and office space uh, right now because of COVID. But once we're past this time, then what else can it be? I think some, um, you, sh you should have, so I, I think the meeting spaces are always going to be useful because community meetings are always, it's always difficult to find spots. So I think that's a great idea. Um, and I do like the, the fact there's a lot of green space. Um, I do like the fact you're not using vinyl siding. Like these little things like I picked up were really good. Um, but, you know, aesthetically, not something I would want to see, but that's me and that's all subjective. Uh, but in terms of, you know, what if the whole remote office space thing, that demand falls, then what happens, right? Is this maybe, do they get rented to, you know, small office environments like insurance companies and things like that? I don't know. Um, but I think some thinking about that would be useful um, because that will have to be in the PUD. So, uh, so some things I really like, I like the community garden idea, fabulous. Uh, be sure to put a deer fence up. Um, and, uh, but uh, in the dog park, and, and I do like that part of it. Um, I do like the idea of um, a focal community area. Um, but, I, but I'm also, it's, it's also just really hard for me um, to say, what is this gonna look like in 20 years? What is this gonna look like in 50 years? What are we doing uh, for our community? And in a lot of ways, I think this is what we need based on the workforce needs um, for housing at Cook. Um, but I'm also concerned about, hey, if this is the last 38 acre piece of land in this area, what are, are is this the very best use for it? And that's just something that um, I'm thinking through 
Uh, but, but again, there are many great things about this. So I appreciate the hard work that's gone into it. Thank you. Am I allowed to respond to a couple of your, couple of your comments? Is that okay? Yes. Um, yeah. I, what do you, I'll just address parking. Um, so per the requirement of our, our proposed unit mix, we would be required to have 1.3 spaces per unit. Um, and we're providing 1.7 spaces per unit. And that does include the retail. And that also does include the, the guest parking around the clubhouse. You know, it's, it's, it's what we try to do is provide 1.7 spaces per unit. We know people have cars. We hope they will walk or bike to work or use the private shuttle, et cetera. But people do have cars. Um, and a type of community like this with the clubhouse and the amenities, people are going to have guests, like you mentioned. So we, we are providing, you know, ample spaces, not only for the residents themselves, but also for, um, for, for the guests. Um, so we do anticipate a lot of couples, a lot of roommate plans, and they will have cars. And we've addressed that in the, in the parking ratio. Um, I put a note on the deer fence. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> We actually designed this use of the private office uh, spaces before COVID even hit or was a, was a factor in the community. Um, and I think uh, Jim with REMAX is on the call himself. There is a significant need for this type of use in private office suites. That demand was there before COVID. Um, and it's just like when you see people having meetings in Starbucks, et cetera, if, they, if there's a, a space they can use to have these meetings, that's why we provided it. And we went out with our proposal actually having the private office suites and it was very well received in the community. Now with COVID, it is just more amplified and even hopefully knock on wood with the vaccines coming out and COVID decreasing, people will still want these private office suites. They know that it's nice to have a home office, but it'd be really nice to have a home office away from home that's walkable. Um, and in terms of addressing the PUD ordinance, you know, if there is a use, we have outlined a bunch of uses that we would allow in the retail, which also would be part of the office, small insurance companies. Um, and we listed a bunch of those uses, but we can refine that. Um, but we feel very strongly the need in this location with all the employment around the area and all the new employment coming in the area, there is a need for this type of a use. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Thomas. Yeah, can I just ask a quick follow-up? I thought on the initial plan that I looked at months back um, that there was something about uh, some sort of covered bike parking areas, especially near the, the studio side and the retail side. Is that still something, or maybe I imagine that or we talked about it, but um, I was just wondering if, if that was something that can be added. Yeah, we... Um... The, the, the depends on how the buildings lay out themselves. The three-story buildings um, along Third Street actually might have extra space where there'll be bike rooms in those buildings, which is nice where they can take the elevator down with their bike and go on their way. Um, but there'll, there'll be bikes, um, typical for Bloomington, I've worked in Bloomington. There'll be bike areas, bike locations located throughout the development. I think you'll be happy with their locations and eventually yeah. what we'll end up proposing. Yeah, I mean, I know the other apartments have the garages and that's great, but I'm just thinking in terms of something with a lean-to so that they're protected from the elements, that would be really lovely, especially by the retail side and the studios. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. I think Jerry and then Jim have their hand raised. Can we get those bike uh, parking areas heated? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I, what I really wanted to bring up is that even as we transition, God willing, out of a COVID area, I think this is a good place where this is, almost becomes a West Side incubator. We used to think about incubators as being uh, providing, not being, but providing areas to put together widgets and all that stuff. We know that Cook started in a spare bedroom of a uh, an apartment in a, a big apartment complex. Uh, but what if the next startups are online and they're, they're taking meetings and instead of meeting in my front room, I can meet in a real office space and, and give the uh, presentation using some um, up-to-date technologies that's actually provided by the venue and, and not at my expense 
uh, solely, but it's a shared expense by everybody who uses that space. So I, I really feel like um, even a post-COVID world, there's still some opportunities for this office space that they're proposing. So I wouldn't worry about it laying dormant. Um, I'd almost worry about it being overtaxed. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, in, in, in response to that, I think you're right. When we say private office suites, they can be designed to have three or four of them in their own little private space or incubator. The buildings also will have their own private meeting space, just like the clubhouse has for the residents. So someone can hold a meeting in the building. And lastly, they'll also have their own private package room. So they're getting three benefits by providing their offices there. I think what you just pointed out is exactly why the BEDC was so supportive of this. You will get incubator type of companies that will be utilizing this space. Um, and it's a great way to be near the major employer, especially if you are working with or, um, you know, the major like Cook Medical. So if you are a company that is, you know, working with them, it's nice to be in this area where you can have your incubator type of company you know, and have the offices that are in a great location. Jim, did you have a question? Well, thank you. Not a question really, uh, Jackie. Uh, and while others have referred to the quality of the presentation, uh, I'd say uh, it was very compelling. At the same time, of course, I'm uh, listening carefully to the uh, questions from uh, President Margaret and, and Dr. Thomas and, and, and Jerry's humor. So uh, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, I don't see anyone else, Margaret, from the Planning Commission. Okay. Um, I just I have, have one, I have one last thing before you, you cut me off. And this was yeah. a comment I forgot to mention that was in the planning administrational staff. It's important to note that a density of like the 330 units, you know, allows us to, to, to efficiently operate the property. And in terms of operating expenses of the maintenance of the entire project, you know, the density allows us to basically operate this much more efficiently than an older community or a smaller community that is in the neighborhood. So a newer community overall has a much less operating expenses per unit. And the density that we're prov providing helps us to keep the overall cost down and hopefully provide a nice product type with the amenities for the residents. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Avis. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to bring it back to the members of the uh, plan commission to see if there's any further discussion. Uh, this is just the first hearing, so we will be um, hearing this again. So there's no vote to be taken tonight. Uh, but is there any further discussion among ourselves, uh, members of the commission? Dave has his hand raised. Yes, Mr. Warren. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just one, let me make sure I'm unmuted. Yeah, unmuted. Um, one thing I just wanted to point out, and I really appreciate everyone's comments. I think there's a lot to, to like about this. Um, one thing I really like about it that, that hasn't been covered so or covered much so far is that, you know, with adding uh, 300 plus housing units right on the, the Karst Farm Trail, it really increases the value of that trail. Um, and we have such a great network of, of trails in the county and the city. Um, and so, I, you know, there absolutely will be people who, who live in this community who use that trail not just for recreation, but to get to work uh, or to get to school. And I, I think that's a, a great thing. And I'd love to see more of that in the, in the county. Thank you. We have also reached out to the, the park district that controls the Karst Trail. Um, we voluntarily offered if they, if they wanted to do some visit, like some fitness things along the trail in this location, we would sponsor that. Um, so we've actually had conversations with them because um, it's, it's a phenomenal location for ourselves. It's, a, it's our number one amenity. Um, so we've offered to, in this location, potentially help them out with some, some amenities for the trail in this location. That's a very interesting, and I think along this trail, you, you will see some very interesting uh, natural features. I, I think um, near the school, there's a, a lily pond that has been developed by a local person who's sourced the lily ponds and some different botanical and uh, na natural resources that have been added to 
uh, the area along the trail. So it is a nice amenity. Thank you. It is a very nice amenity. Yes, and I'll add, it's nice to hear about your offer to the Parks Department as I also serve as a Park Board member, so. Yes, thank you, Amy. We also potentially offer to have some of those, um, those lock bikes, you know, where it's the public can, you know, do a bike and, you know, rent it um, to go for a bike ride. And um, of course, we'd have Westgate on third, you know, on the bike itself. But it, you know, it'd be a, a nice amount, a nice amount of be. I don't know if the seller Jackie is on the call. I thought she thought it was important um, to speak. Actually, um, I'm not sure if she's on the call or not. But I just want to see if she. Okay. Uh, hey. The seller's yeah. daughter's on the call. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I think we have a couple more questions from plan commission members and then Margaret, maybe we will come back to, do you wanna go ahead and hear the owner first and then come back to the plan commission? Yes, let's do that. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'm, I'm not the seller, I'm her daughter, Patty Pace. And my mother's 91 years old and a lifelong resident of Monroe County. And just a little bit of background, my mom and dad bought their land in 1954 and they proceeded to build their forever home themselves. And as lifelong residents, they were concerned about the development of Monroe County. And over the years, my parents have received countless requests to sell their land as Bloomington grew out to them. And at my mom's age, she's thinking ahead in estate planning. She realized that if the land was developed before her death, she would be able to see what was done with it. And after talking to several potential buyers, um, my brother and my mom and I decided to go with the Red Hawk Delman Development Company team. Their vision fits into what the area needs and their vision also most closely resembled Monroe County's land use plans for our property. And all of us, we'd like the fact that it was a, be a cohesive community and then we'll have several green spaces as my dad was a farmer, so he would appreciate that. And there's a great need for a new rental community in Monell County, and we feel this plan will address this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for attending and also for uh, caring so much about the property that your family has owned and how you would like to uh, see it develop. That's important as well. So thank you. You're welcome. So uh, back to the members of the plan commission, Jackie, do you see anyone who would like to add anything? Yeah, we've got Tron and then Jerry. Mine's just really short and it's just more of a comment. Um, this is flipped around. So the north uh, west part of the um, lot, uh, that runs with the Kars Greenway um, and then it goes right there on um, the frontage of uh, third 48, right? Um, thank you. Right there. I, I know just as a personal user of the trail, you, you get lost right there. So I, I, with that, that little 90 degree turn, I, it, it's kind of hard to tell that you're still on the car screenway right there. So as, as you're looking to enhance that, I do think that it's only going to bring more value and character to your uh, site um, as, as you're able to kind of promote the Kars Greenway. It, it, you kind of get lost in there sometimes. And I got lost there several times. So maybe as you're working closer with other people, there could be a way where you could really emphasize that that is part of that trail. And then you kind of make that um, turn going up uh, uh, profile parkway. Um, so I just wanted to bring some attention to that, that that could be some very easy fixes there that could really um, promote that trail a bit more. Um, outside of that, I was quite, I was curious, are we going to take public comment today? Is that part of our process today? Uh, yes, we can take public comment. Yes. Okay. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> yes. And that's all I had. Thank you. Okay. Jerry, you have your hand raised. Yeah. Uh, earlier you had read into the record the uh, comments, and I didn't know if that was going to 
be the case or not. And if it isn't, I'd like to uh, read into the record a portion of what I had put into the chat. Go ahead, Jerry. I, I just wanted to say that as I listened to the uh, petitioner's representative that I was reminded of how um, in the couple of decades that I've been on the plan commission uh, on and off, um, we've encouraged connectivity and in this instance, instance, I believe we have to uh, trust that the infrastructure improvements and the standards that we've established are arguably met on this site. And uh, further, as somebody who's uh, made his way from a renter to a homeowner, uh, it appears to me that individuals and families could uh, move from the multifamily structures to this single family structures in this neighborhood without ever actually leaving the neighborhood. They could put down roots, they can still move up, uh, so to speak, and never really leave their neighbors. And I think that's a, an amazing uh, situation to be in. So um, I just want to throw that out there. Uh, I think by and large, this is uh, the, the kind of uh, development that we've never seen before and I don't want us to get lost in the weeds of it. And then lastly, I'd wonder if the weather permits, if we have a day, uh, would it be possible to go out and walk the site as a plan commission? We've done that a few times in the past when there were really significant and large parcels of ground that were being developed. And I would love for uh, a number of us to be able to go out and walk and get the visual concept with the instruction of the developer. And that's all I have. Those are good suggestions, Mr. Pittsford, and I would be game to go out and walk the property as well. I know that area pretty well, but not at the ground level right there at the worm's eye level of that property. Um, are there any other uh, questions, Jackie, from members of the plan commission or shall we? I, I do see two more, um, Jim Stainbrook and Dave, and then we'll probably need to move on to the, to the public's comments. But Jim Stainbrook first and then oh, Dave second. Jackie, I'll try to be uh, quick, uh, but to acknowledge the uh, value of Jerry's uh, suggestion about walking, I've done that. And at my age, uh, the one walk was enough. So I hope you'll excuse me. Now, if we could ride horses out there and around. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Uh, Dave, did you have a comment? Yeah, I would just like to, I like the idea of doing a walk too. And if we do, I'd like to request, uh, number one, that Jeff bring his drone to take pictures and number two that Jim be allowed to ride on horseback. <laughs> as long as he brings me a horse, I'm in favor. <laughs> and um, I, I just I, want to make one other comment and this is because it should be at the forefront of our mind in terms of density. We're going from uh, 14 basically allowable um, homes to 330. And just to keep that present in our minds as we take comments from the public. So are there members of the public who would like to speak in favor of the uh, proposal before us? Yes, I do see um, a, a few folks with their hands raised. And Margaret, do you want me to put a timer on for folks or are we just having folks comment and Could be you mindful? Could you have an idea how many people are present, uh, Jackie? Um, I see three folks with their hands raised, but we've, we've got probably about uh, seven or so. Okay, so let's uh, go with three minutes and uh, for each person. And okay. if you could put the timer on, that would be helpful. Uh, okay. I'll need just a moment, please. All right. Tech services is going to help us with that. Thank you. Um, so just so we see who's in the... Um, Q for speaking. We've got Lisa Abbott, Adam Maxwell, and then Jim Shelton. Thank you. Also note um, from Julie, we may need to just logistically speak about um, the plan commission going to the property all together would constitute a possible quorum. So we'll, we'll we will figure that one out. Um, Okay, looks like Tech Services is putting a timer up. Um, do you want to share your screen, Tech Services, for the timer? 
Uh, yeah, I can. Um, this is a less intrusive way to do it, but if you want me to do it so it takes over everybody's screen, I can do that. Sure. Okay, um, so with the, uh, I forget the person you have up first to speak, Jackie. Lisa Abbott, are you here? Yeah. I am. Thank so you. I, um, thank you for uh, letting us speak tonight. I wanted to um, echo some of the comments that I heard from Mr. Pittsburgh. Um, the housing choice continuum that um, we've been talking about tonight is really called missing middle, which is the housing choice between single family housing and really large complexes. And we in Bloomington and Monroe County don't have a great number of those housing units. And I really love this project for a number of reasons. Um, I think it really incorporates a lot of those ideas. It um, starts off with uh, more dense um, development closer to our main thoroughfares, and it includes 84 units of barrier-free housing, which I can tell you when I was the hand director, um, we used to get a lot of calls looking for um, barrier-free housing, and we just never had enough. And I and I really appreciate, and I want to thank the developer for incorporating that into this into this project. As it goes back towards the neighborhood, it becomes less dense and provides different style of housing choices for people. And one of the comments that he made was that you could live in this area as a renter and a number of different housing options and then buy into a neighborhood and the neighborhood to the east already has basically missing middle housing. It, it has a number of options, including, you know, uh, multifamily, uh, townhouses, duplexes, single family, um, all in that same area. So I think that this it incorporates um, really well into that area. Um, I, can we, I wanted to make sure that we also discuss how tight the housing market continues to be, not just with owner-occupied housing, but with rental housing. I had the opportunity to talk to um, a friend who is um, a property manager, and she mostly manages properties that are not related to students. And she said that she has never been as full for next year as she is right now. She is leasing up at great rates for next year because of the pandemic, people don't wanna move. And so they're staying put. And so there isn't a lot of movement in the housing market. And I think that this addition of these units is gonna be greatly appreciated in the years to come. So I think that is all I have to say, but I encourage you to support this. I think it's a good option to increase our housing inventory. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Abbott. Thank you very much for taking time to talk with us today. And Jackie, who is next? So we have Adam. Adam, would you like to speak? And uh, yes, thank you for resetting the clock. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm a, a homeowner uh, in Stone Chase, the, um, the housing development uh, just to the west of this proposed uh, community. Uh, and, and by and large, I think that this is great for all of the reasons uh, that you had mentioned I'm very much in support of, uh, support of it. Two uh, particular things, I, I, I would, be curious for the for the plan commission to think a little bit more with, with the, the the petitioner ab about that connection on the West King Rail Drive. I, I think that there, especially with the addition of the um, uh, the potential retail businesses, there might be value uh, to be able to uh, to connect uh, to those as well as over to Park Square Drive without having to go out on on Forty Eight. Um, and then also for uh, given the comment that. Uh, that Mr. Warren mentioned earlier about sort of the long-term uh, value of, of potentially uh, making that part of the plan. I think there's value there. And then the other thing is that uh, as uh, as the um, developer is continuing with this project, I, I would really hope to see uh, uh, businesses uh, in, in terms of some of those retail uh, you know, first floor businesses, I think in that building too, that would be things like maybe coffee shops or restaurants or things like that, that would uh, be able to, to serve not just the folks in, in, uh, in, uh, in the new community here, but the, the surrounding ones and sort of a nice walkable um, uh, business. But by and large, I, I'm, you know, very, very supportive of this uh, for all the sort of macro reasons of value to Bloomington or Nero County, but also uh, sort of, you uh, you know, as as a neighbor to this to this uh, new development, I, I am really looking forward to it. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marksy. 
And then the, the third person, Jackie? Yeah, then we have Jim Shelton. Mr. Shelton, we'd like to hear from you. Good evening, Commission. Uh, Jim Shelton with the Greater Boomington Chamber of Commerce. We certainly are in support of this. We need, as you've heard several times, much more housing. And then as a member of the Monroe County Redevelopment Commission, I want to make sure you realize that we are just about to finish the extension of Profile Parkway through the old ABB site, opening it up to, we hope, uh, a great deal of development that will provide uh, a lot of jobs out there. And then Ms. Ridge just finished the uh, connector from Daniels Parkway out to Hart Street Road and then up to the uh, West Y. And that opens up another big chunk of land for development. So there's a very good likelihood that over the next 10 years, there will be many, many more jobs out there. So, and then I just think personally, this is a terrific uh, thing. When my wife and I had to downsize, if this had been available, we would have possibly uh, chosen that. So please support this. And uh, I really appreciate your work though on the details. That's really, really great that you all put all this time into those kinds of things. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shelton, for taking time to let us know your thoughts today. Um, also, Jackie, are there any members of the public who are here to speak in opposition to this proposal? I'm not seeing anyone. Tech services, I think if you want to, um, I could share the screen again to do the PowerPoint. Um, thank you. Let me see if there's anyone with their hand raised. I'm not seeing anyone. I'm glad that guy that was on the screen wasn't going to speak against it. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, we've had a really nice meeting tonight. Um, I don't, I think that concludes then our discussion of this proposed project for this meeting. Um, I'm going to check to see if there are any other items on the agenda. We have, are there any reports from um, Mr. Wilson from planning? Uh, there is a meeting of the ordinance committee uh, scheduled for tomorrow evening at 530 uh, to continue the review of the first module from uh, the consultants of the zoning ordinance. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to move forward to the entire plan commission uh, sometime in December. Uh, just an update, we've been very busy. I think already we have exceeded our fees for last year, uh, which is remarkable. Uh, that also has resulted in us having to order new signs for uh, uh, to post for meetings and uh, I think we have to go and get postage tomorrow in order to send out notices for the, the several meetings. Uh, so it, it's good that things have continued as far as um, the development community uh, during this time when much of the economy has been shut down. So uh, other than that, we're uh, doing the best we can given the situation. Well, thank you for your hard work and also for your attention to those details, making sure that the public is able to participate and able to weigh in on the plans for the very community that they treasure and that they live in and that they use. So that's a very important component of this entire process. Um, the, finally, I think uh, if Mr. Schilling is here, are there any reports from legal, county legal? Uh, Dave mentioned that he wasn't able to make it tonight. I see. Well, if there is none, then we can entertain a motion to adjourn and then go on to our lovely evenings. <laughs> so moved. Is, is there a second? I second that. Okay, all in favor can just say aye or just if you're opposed, let it be known. <laughs> thank you all. It's so good to see you and have a good evening. And thank uh -huh. you for your time.